Hey everyone, welcome to The Ridge Online. My name is Adam. We're so glad that you're tuning in and you're worshiping with us today as we continue this series called YOLO, You Only Live Once. Uh, as we all know, the last, it seems like forever, we have been strictly online and we haven't been able to meet in person on Sundays, but we've been blessed to worship together from wherever we are through online. And so uh, this week is slightly different. Usually we have our uh, band and our production team and our pastor teaching that weekend. They come on Sunday morning and we go live online uh, for worship this week is a little different. We are going to be uh, pre-recorded, and uh, here is why. So one of our staff members here at the Ridge uh, last week tested positive for COVID, and uh, they are doing well. They're recovering, and uh, which is awesome. Uh, but they were in the building at some point last week, and so we felt that it would be safe and uh, smart for our staff and our volunteers to stay at home this week. And that includes today, Sunday. So uh, what's great is we pre-recorded uh, the talk that Tim is gonna give. So it's gonna be brand new and it's gonna continue with this YOLO series. Our worship is from a uh, previous uh, Sunday, but it's still gonna be just as powerful and awesome as usual. So uh, again, we are glad that you're tuning in. It may be a little bit different than normal, but it's still gonna be a powerful Sunday. And we're so glad that you're tuning in and worshiping with us. So with that being said, uh, we uh, are going to kick off our time right now with some worship. So from wherever you are, we encourage you to sing out and worship with us. We're glad that you're here. Breakthroughs on our side 
His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus.
Lord, your love is so amazing, so great. When I think that the creator of the heavens and the earth was willing to come down and die in our place and for our sin, because you knew, O oh God, that we could not merit eternal life. You knew that we couldn't fix ourselves up enough to, to be able to make it with you. And so you sent your son to be the perfect sacrifice for us, dying in our place and for the things we've done wrong. We praise you that he conquered sin and death when he rose again from the dead and that we know that when we put our trust in Jesus to be our savior, we receive the free gift of eternal life. And for that, we are eternally grateful to you. Your love is truly amazing. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand it and believe it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, recently, I was considering the question in my own life, why is it that I give, especially give to the church? And I realized that there were several reasons. One of them was that for me, personally, it's an acknowledgement that everything came from God anyway. When I'm giving back to God, I'm saying, Lord, I acknowledge it all came from you, and I just want to give back a, a portion as an acknowledgement of that. Second, for me, it's a step of faith. Every month, I'm, I have to ask myself the question, do I trust that if I give this, that God will provide for me? I look at my giving, and I think I could use that money to pay for bills or other things. Do I really believe that if I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, everything else will be added to me, and I do. And third, for me, it's an expression of my love for Him. You know, God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, and, and this is an opportunity for us to give back to God, to, to give toward the things that are on God's heart, the spreading of the gospel and other things. When I think of the church in particular, I think of the work, though, that's being done around here. And I realize even if I didn't work for Chestnut Ridge, I'd want to support the ministry here because I think of, first of all, the thousands of lives that are being impacted every week as the gospel goes out. And I'm thinking of the work that's being done behind the scenes so that our small groups can flourish. I've been so encouraged to realize that during this pandemic, our groups have actually grown and more people are getting, getting plugged in and, and the, these ministries are being supported because of the gifts of people that care about the ministry here. I think of lives that are being changed and I hear stories about marriages that are being strengthened and I think of the work that we're doing outside of our doors. We've begun some dialogues related to racial reconciliation. We've been We've been doing food drives and other things like that to try to impact the community. We're supporting other organizations and ministries in this town. We want to make a difference outside of our doors. And so I want to encourage you. Some of you perhaps have never given before to a church, and maybe you'd consider doing that. Take that step of faith. Others of you have been giving, but maybe, maybe you haven't been faithful recently, and I encourage you to continue to be faithful because I'm confident that God will bless you for your giving. And some of you maybe have the ability to give above and beyond what you normally do. Obviously, during this time, uh, giving is down because of the pandemic. Some of you are able to make a greater difference. Let me mention one last thing, though, as I was thinking about what's been happening in our country today. One thought that occurred to me is that I don't know for sure, but I think in the days ahead, it's going to be harder and harder for us to be spreading the gospel. I think things are changing in our culture so that it's going to be very difficult in the future to talk to people about Jesus, that laws might even be passed. As a church, of course, we're committed to doing that to the very end. But recognize that right now we have a door of opportunity. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Let's take a minute to pray before we have a short break for our offering. Father, we do acknowledge every good and perfect gift comes from you. We acknowledge that you are the God that's able to provide for all of our needs, and we want to be faithful to you. I want to thank you, Lord, for those who have been giving, and I ask you, Lord, to bless and prosper them for that, Lord. As Solomon talked about, may their barns be full. And Lord, I ask you too, as we as leaders determine how to best steward what is given, that we would use this, this money for the best cause, the, the best things. We want to be faithful to you, recognizing that it, it comes from you and at the sacrifice of others. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Why don't we take a minute to pray before we jump into our subject this morning? 
Uh, Heavenly Father, we look to you today. We ask you to speak to us through your word. We do recognize that your word is living, it's active. As the writer of Hebrews put it, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's able, Lord, to accomplish your work in our hearts and in our lives. And we really do want to be impacted by what your word teaches. And so we just ask you to give us ears to hear today and help us to apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. An author by the name of Kevin Harney in his book, Seismic Shifts, tells the story about this little boy that was sitting in the nursery at church. And, and as he was sitting on the floor there, he had in each of his hands a little red ball. And then wedged underneath his little pudgy knees, he had three Nerf balls. And he was trying to control all of these, trying to protect all of these because other kids wanted to play with these balls. The balls that were particularly close to the front of his feet were the most vulnerable. And so anytime a child came near, he'd kind of snarl at that child. He wanted to make it really clear that he did not want to share. Harney said as he watched this that he was tempted to step in and make the boy share the balls with the other kids. But he was so wrapped up in what was happening, the scene as it was unfolding, that he decided just to watch and see what happened. Harney describes the scene, though, in this way. He said, the little boy was like a hyena hunched over the last scraps of a carcass. This snarling little canine was not in the mood for sharing. The other kids circled like vultures around for the kill, looking for a way to jump in and snatch a ball without being attacked and bitten. Harney says that he didn't know whether to laugh or to cry, but one thing he did observe at a certain point is that the little boy that had all five of the balls was not happy at all. In fact, he observed that none of the kids within 10 feet of this little boy was happy. It was almost as if this little boy, through his selfishness, had created a black hole that sucked all of the joy out of the room. And this is the way the situation continued until a little while later his parents came into the room and took him home. I think it's human nature for us to be selfish. It's human nature for us to want to hold on to the things that we have and not to share with other people. I think we come pre-packaged in this way. No parent teaches their kid to be selfish. It's just the way we are. And it has been this way ever since Adam and Eve. When they chose for themselves in the Garden of Eden, they said, this is something I want, and they reached for that fruit. And we now share in their corrupted spiritual DNA. Even those who don't believe that the Bible's true or people that don't claim to be Christians acknowledge that selfishness is not a good thing and it's a universal problem. And when people give in to selfishness, they become like Scrooges and Grinches. Uh, Today we're going to continue our series titled YOLO, You Only Live Once. It's a series based on the wisdom that Solomon shared with us on a variety of different subjects. Today specifically, I want to focus on what Solomon had to say concerning our attitude toward those who are poor or those who are needy. What obligation do we have to help meet the needs of those around us? As I was reflecting on this talk, I was wondering in my own mind about my own upbringing. I've never talked with my three brothers about this, but I have wondered before if they would consider that our upbringing was poor, that we were poor when we were growing up. The more I think about it, the more I think that's probably the case. My dad was a pastor of a a medium-sized church in his day, but the board that he was under had the perspective that, that they shouldn't pay him what a normal person in the workplace should make. His salary was about 25% less than most of the people in the congregation because the board thought this is a way to get my father to trust God more, to make him financially needy. I'm so thankful that our board is not like that here, but we did not have what we needed, and our family was a fairly large family. There were six of us, four hungry boys. And so as a result, my twin brother and I often had to wear hand-me-downs, And it was hand-me-down clothing from our brothers, but usually it had been bought at Kmart. It wasn't necessarily high-quality clothing. And often people in the congregation would see that we needed clothing, and so they'd donate clothes to us. And and sometimes they'd help in other ways. One family in the church discovered that we didn't have enough money to buy a bedroom suit for my twin brother and me, and so someone in the congregation went out and took care of that need. But it seemed like we always had needs. 
When we on, went on vacation, we never stopped at restaurants. My mom would make these bologna and mar, margarine sandwiches. They were, they were horrible. They would kind of slide down to this day. I just, I, I just absolutely hate the thought of those sandwiches. I think she didn't want to use mayonnaise because it would spoil, perhaps. I don't know, but that was what our lunches were. Oftentimes, we ate things like liver and, and fried spam and things like this. The car our parents drove was a car that I was ashamed of. It was this station wagon, but it had that fake wood paneling on it. And I, I just remember as, as we were growing up that I was so embarrassed about the car we drove, the clothes we wore. You would think with a background like this that I would have an above-average sympathy toward those who are poor. But as I was reflecting on this subject, I realized that most of the time when I consider those who are poor or needy, I have more of a judgmental attitude. I'm not talking about people that I know. Many times I know someone's situation, and then I do have compassion. But when talking about just the poor in general, oftentimes I realize that I think that they're in that position because of maybe something they did, something they did wrong perhaps. Or perhaps they're not willing to work hard to earn money. Or perhaps they're wasting their money on, on drinking too much or something like that. And it doesn't occur to me that many times people are in their impoverished situation because they were born into that situation. That some people did not have as good a start as other people had. I mean, if we're honest, we'd have to admit that. That the cards are stacked against some people. That the playing field is not level. That not everyone had the same opportunities or has the same opportunities. And that we as believers in Christ are called to have compassion toward those who are poor, toward those who are needy. Some people, in fact, are in their situation due to no nothing on their, on their part at all. They found that they got some kind of a health situation and they lost everything. Suddenly, someone who used to have a lot suddenly finds out that they have to be homeless. How should we feel about those who are poor or needy? What is our responsibility to be t toward others? And, and when should we give? When should we not give? You know, when we see people standing on street corners and around Morgantown, you'll see them at various corners. Should we give under those circumstances or shouldn't we? What if people take advantage of the gifts that we give? When should we have compassion toward those who are poor and needy? Now, what I know for sure is that when a person is comfortable and their needs are met, it's hard many times to consider the needs of other people that aren't as fortunate. And it's very easy for us to judge other people for the situation in which they find themselves. And I think part of the problem is we just don't understand what it means to be poor. Recently, I read about an exclusive school located in Hollywood attended by students who were children of movie stars and producers and directors. They were asked to write a composition related to the subject of poverty, and this was one little girl's story, her little literary piece. She wrote, once there was a poor little girl, her father was poor, her mother was poor, her governess was poor, her chauffeur was poor, her butler was poor. In fact, everybody in the house was very, very poor. It's hard to understand poverty if you've never faced it. And not only do the poor have to struggle with just the concern of every day making sure that they have food and clothing and what they need, but oftentimes there's a stigma or shame associated with being poor or needy. Solomon acknowledged this. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 20, Solomon wrote, a poor man is hated even by his neighbor, but there are many who love the rich. A poor man is hated even by his neighbor, but there are many who love the rich. I'd like to suggest that many times our motives are tested by the way that we love people. Do we love people conditionally or unconditionally? This proverb is saying even someone who lives next door to someone who's in need looks down upon that person. But if someone is wealthy, everyone is looking to be that person's friend. Everyone wants to associate with that person, but they don't want to associate with this person. In Proverbs 19 and verse 7, Solomon wrote, All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends keep their distance from him? He may pursue them with words, but they are not there. Solomon was making the observation that 
if family members don't love a poor brother or sister, how much harder will it be for someone who isn't a family member, a, a friend or a neighbor, to love that person? It's hard. It's hard to think that this is what Solomon would write about, what it means to be poor, but he was just absor- observing what the reality of the situation is. That many times when someone is poor and needy, it's easy to judge that person. It's easy to look down upon that person. And it kind of saddens my heart to realize this because already they're suffering because of their need, let alone having to be looked down upon by a society. So what is our responsibility and how should we view those in need? And and are there good reasons that we should help out? My takeaway this morning is this. And it really comes right from the lips of Jesus. Give, and it will be given to you. This is what Jesus asks us to do. Give, and it will be given to us. And this truth is taught throughout the pages of the Bible. God loves it when we care for people, especially those who are in need. In fact, I think this is God's primary way of meeting the needs of other people. He wants to use believers who have a heart for people, who care for people. We are the hands and feet of Christ. We are the mouth of Christ. And God wants us to be the ones that meet those needs. He could, of course, intervene. He could directly take care of those needs. But I think He calls for us to do it. Because when we do it, we receive a blessing. Give and it'll be given to you. Jesus was the one who said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And there is indeed a blessing associated when we're ones who give. Now, I find Solomon's perspective on this whole subject to be quite interesting because he was so wealthy. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, Solomon was so wealthy that in his day, silver was considered as something not valuable at all. It was considered like stones in his day and age. It was so, he was so wealthy. The whole community was so wealthy. And yet, here's a, a man who had everything, and yet he had a heart for the poor. Why? Why did Solomon care for those who were poor? Well, in Proverbs 22 and verse 2, Solomon wrote, The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. Solomon acknowledged the fact that that everybody was created in the image of God. And so when God looks down upon humanity, he doesn't see, oh, that's a rich person or that's a poor person. He looks at all of them and recognizes all of them were created in His image. All of them, from His perspective, are valuable and worthwhile. And this is the perspective I think we need to have when we see those who are poor or those who are in need, to realize God created that person as well as creating me. In Proverbs 14 and verse 31, Solomon wrote this, "'The one who oppresses the poor person insults his Maker.'" but the one who is kind to the needy honors him. Let me read that again. The one who oppresses the poor person insults God, insults his maker, but the one who is kind to the needy honors him. Now, this is kind of a sobering thought, but God is looking down and He takes offense when we mistreat those who are poor. God is personally impacted by this. When we oppress a poor person, we are literally insulting God, which is, again, an interesting thought, the idea that we can insult God, but God takes it personally. He looks down at how we treat people. But when we care for the needy, when we're kind to those who are poor, those who are in need, it is one way in which we honor God. And God tends to bless us as a result. Again, my takeaway this morning is this, give and it will be given to you. This truth is taught again throughout the pages of the Bible. In Proverbs 19 and verse 17, Solomon wrote, kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord, and He will give a reward to the lender. Kindness to the poor is like loaning money to God, and He will give a reward to the lender. I find this kind of interesting because you realize God owns everything. And yet, this is an occasion where Solomon said you can actually loan to God and he's going to give a good return, a good ROI. You know what an ROI is? It's a rate on return. And and Solomon was saying here that we actually make an investment. When we show kindness to the poor, 
An investment is made in heaven, and God will recognize this. He will reward, it says, the lender for doing that. And by the way, I think this is true whenever we give to God's work, even for advancing the kingdom of God, giving to the church or to other ministries or whatever else that we do to advance God's purposes. Jesus himself said that we should store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust won't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. And so you realize that there is a way in which we can make heavenly investments, and one way we do that is that when we're kind to the poor, when we help them out then God will bless us. Now, conversely, there's a warning associated when we don't listen to the needs of the poor. In Proverbs 21 and verse 13, Solomon wrote, the one who shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will himself also call out and not be answered. This is the same principle that I think Jesus emphasized when he said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This says if you shut your ears to the cry of the poor, one day you'll be crying out and your needs will not be met. Why is this the case? Well, I think part of the reason this is the case is because when somebody is kind and helps other people, when they are in need, others will come to their aid. Others will remember how they were treated by you. One of my wife's favorite movies around Christmas time is It's a Wonderful Life. It's the story of George Bailey. For those of you that have seen the movie, George Bailey was someone who was kind to a lot of people. He helped a lot of people as a banker get a home of their own, and he was always concerned about their needs and concerned about their welfare, often to his own detriment. He could have enriched himself more, but instead he turned the profits back over to the bank so that he could loan money to more people. But then there came a situation in his own life where he was in need, where he needed money, and and there was really no way out. The debt he owed was beyond his ability to pay. He was even looking at going to prison because of it. And then the whole community rallied around him. And they raised the money and they gave it to him. This is the principle at work here when you're that kind of person who cares for other people. Then when you have need, people care for you. There are other verses, though, that support this idea from Proverbs, this idea of give and it'll be given to you. Proverbs 11, verses 24 to 26, we read, one person gives freely yet gains more. Another withholds what is right only to become poor. A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. People will curse anyone who hoards grain, but a blessing will come to the one who sells it. Isn't this my takeaway? Give and it will be given to you. Two types of individuals are being contrasted here. One is the generous person. This person is described as someone who gives freely. The stingy person, though, is someone who's described as withholding. In fact, they even withhold what's rightfully due. They hold on to things. The generous generous person is described as someone who shares, especially when there's a shortage. They're willing to share with other people. The stingy person, though, is someone who holds on to what they have. They hoard what they have. So what is the outcome between the two types? Well, it's kind of ironic. The generous person who gives ends up being enriched in greater ways. That person ends up getting richer, according to Solomon. And the stingy person, the person who holds on Making sure that they have what they need, they end up in lack. They end up in want. And this is oftentimes the way it is. Because in life, we tend to reap what we sow. Or as Solomon put it in verse 25 that I just read, one who gives a drink of water will receive water. What you do for other people will come back to you. And part of the reason for this, again, is that I think people tend to treat us the way we treat them, and part of the reason is that there's a special blessing that comes from God when we're generous and when we give and when we care about the needs of other people. And this is why I think Jesus said, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. When I think of that verse, I think of the first part of it as being that you receive back from other people. In other words, give and it'll be given to you. I I tend to think that's just the natural principle that when you give to other people, it'll come back to you. But the rest of what Jesus said, I think, is the God part. 
Jesus said what you'll get back will be pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's like you, you give this container full of grain to someone else, it comes back to you, but it has been shaken down and pressed down and is running over, it's in abundance. And I think that's the God part. This principle, by the way, again, is found throughout Scripture, that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we read that the Apostle Paul was raising money to give to the poor that lived in the city of Jerusalem. Now, I don't know the circumstances why the people in the city of Jerusalem were so poor, but Paul traveled around to all the other churches, and he was raising funds to give to the poor and to the needy in the city of Jerusalem. And he said something interesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 in verse 6, and he was speaking about giving to the poor. He said, remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. The word sowing here in this verse has the idea of giving to the poor. And so he was saying here, if you're stingy in your giving, then it'll come back to you in a stingy way. You'll get a stingy return. But if you're generous, you'll get a generous return. And of course, this is the way it is in life. If you sow a lot of seed in your field, you're going to get a good return. If you sow a little seed in a field, if you plant just a few plants, you're going to get a small return. And Paul was applying this in the spiritual sense to giving and said, this is how it'll come back to you. Now, I want us to understand that this doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get back apples for apples. Sometimes people say, well, if you give to God, you'll get exactly the same amount back. Or I've even heard ministers say that if you give a certain amount to God, He'll multiply a tenfold. That is not how this thing works. God will give back to us in different ways, many times in this life, but sometimes even in the next life. It's not exactly an apples for apples thing, but the principle holds true that people who give will be blessed both by other people and by God. Give and it will be given to you. A few verses later in this same chapter, Paul confirms the idea. In verse 10, in response to being generous to the poor, Paul wrote, now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Paul reminds them again that God is the one who gives us everything we have. And he was saying when you give to the poor, realize that the one who gives you seed and the one who provides bread for food for you will provide for you and multiply your seed. You'll get a very good return, a large ROI, rate on return and it'll increase the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, God will credit it to your account as a righteous act. Now, again, it's not always apples for apples, but the principle holds true that God blesses those who have a heart to take care of the needs of other people. Paul goes on to say in this chapter, by the way, that when we give, then other people are going to be blessed, and they will bless us in return. They will pray for us in return, and they'll glorify God in return. And so, so many good things happen when we care for the needs of other people. So, what should we do about this? Well, I want to encourage us to look for opportunities to give to the poor. In biblical times, this was a concept that was called piety. But there are opportunities that we're faced with often where we can care for the needs of other people. As I was thinking about this talk, I was reminded of how John the Baptist was approached by a crowd and they asked him what they should do. John, of course, had come to prepare the way for Jesus. He was preaching to the people and trying to get their hearts ready so that they could receive the Messiah. And the people regarded John the Baptist as being a prophet. And so they asked John, what should we do? What do you want us to do in response to what you're saying? And John the Baptist's response was this. It's found in Luke chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. It says, what then shall we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. If you have two shirts, share with someone who doesn't have a shirt. If you have extra food, give to someone who doesn't. Now, obviously, we've got to read this within the context of the culture. This isn't saying for us in our culture today, well, if you have two shirts, you shouldn't. 
give away all the rest of them. We live in a culture that's very different. We live in a culture in which, for example, if you work in an office, you, you are expected to wear a different shirt every day, or I, I hope you do. I think if this were applied to, to our culture today, it would go something like this. He who has 20 shirts should give away 10. He who has 20 pairs of shoes should maybe give away 10 pairs or 15 pairs of shoes because there are people around us who are in need. It's important in the bi biblical terms to realize that God gives us certain things to own and then from within the position of owning those things out of a generous heart we want to give. And so when we have things that we own and we're able to give, this is something that promotes goodwill, it promotes sharing, and it's not something that we should be forced to do. It's something that often reveals our heart. But I think all of us could give more. Now, let me give us some practical steps that I think we can take in response to this. Number one is to pray about giving to specific needs when you're exposed to them. I recognize that giving to various needs these days requires wisdom. I, I admit that many times if I see someone asking for money on a street corner that oftentimes I'm not inclined to give, but, but I'll often at least ask God about it. Lord, do you want me to give? And these days we're, we're exposed to so many different needs and, and we don't know if they're legitimate needs or not. I would suggest, by the way, that we err on the side of generosity. But I want to encourage you to start praying about it and ask God, do you want me to help out in this situation? And again, if we're going to err on one side, I'd err on the side of generosity. Because even if the person is being dishonest, when we give, I think there's a blessing that comes back to us. Another way we could apply this is to donate, use clothing, food, and other items. This is part of the reason, by the way, we have a coat drive every year, and we do food drives every year. And I am, I'm so encouraged when I think of our church in this regard, because when we last gathered food, I think we gathered about six tons worth of food that was given away that you were generous to give. This is exactly the spirit of what John the Baptist was talking about, or when you donate those extra coats. And so donate some of the extra things you have to those that might be in need. Third application, give time and energy to help those in need. For example, some of you have been involved in helping to build houses for Habitat for Humanity. Or some of you have gone on missions trips and you've helped build a house for someone who is poor. Another way that you could apply this is to sponsor a child through Compassion International or maybe through the Child Development Center in Honduras. One of our churches in Honduras is sponsoring dozens and dozens of children, but they need people to help sponsor those kids so that they could feed them, but also share the gospel with them and teach them. They actually do school for these kids, but it requires these children to be sponsored. Uh, you can also financially support organizations that help the poor, or you can help out with things like Operation Christmas Child. And then one last thing you can do is maybe give to the Church Benevolence Fund. We do receive calls on occasion where people have needs, and so occasionally people will give to the church, and then they'll put on their benevolence, and so we reserve that to give to people that may have a need. Let me close with a verse that was actually penned by Solomon's father, King David. He wrote in Psalm 41 and verse 1, he said, "'Happy is the one who cares for the poor.'" The Lord will save him in the day of adversity. Happy is the one who cares for the poor. The Lord will save him in the day of adversity. In other words, give and it will be given to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We recognize, God, that you have taken care of our needs. And now you call us to be a vehicle to meet the needs of other people. And I ask you, Lord, that you would lead us in the way you want us to go in this regard. Give us a heart, first of all, to care. Lord, I just pray that there'd be a change that would take place in our hearts so that when we see people who are needy, that our heart would go out to those people. And then give us the wisdom we need to know when it's appropriate to step in and when it's not to. To recognize that there are times when we just need to say no if people are irresponsible. But that many times we need to be saying yes we ask you to help us with these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Again, we're glad that you tuned in and worship with us today. And uh, we encourage you to go to our website, theridge.church, uh, for all kinds of info and things coming up and, and ways that you can uh, engage with us and take a next step. If you need prayer today, we want to pray for you. So we encourage you to go to theridge.church slash prayer requests. Let us know how we can pray for you right now. But again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next Sunday.